Good morning. Welcome to a peaceful protest. <laughs> Our governor has asked churches to forego in-person services. Uh, but did you know that the Red Mile racetrack is still open for business? You, uh, you can pe- play the slots, but you can't pray in church. You can Black Friday shop, but you can't have Thanksgiving with your extended family. You can't send your kids to school, but you can go to the abortion clinic. So, we stand together in protest to a tyrannical government overreach. We also take a stand against the darkness and godlessness that desires to still kill and destroy the abundant life that our Savior Jesus Christ died to give us. We take a stand against the spirit of addiction, abuse, anxiety, depression, suicide, and hatefulness that is so prevalent in our culture currently. Thank you for standing with me. I believe there's a reason that God commands us to not forsake the assembling of together as some are in in the habit of doing, but more and more to come together, especially as we see the day approaching. It is not by accident It is not arbitrary that God commands us to come together. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. And so we believe today that the Spirit of God is in this place. And where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. Amen? Amen? Jesus said, come to me, all who are weak and weary, and I will give you rest. We believe rest is found in this place where God's people are assembled in his name. The ecclesia, the body of Christ assembled, the church is essential. It would be unloving and disobedient to not give the people of this city a place to pray, worship, partake of the body and blood of Christ, to grow in their faith by the hearing of God's word. All that to say, we will not comply. The government has no right by the Constitution, or ordained by God to tell the church how or when we should meet. When government leaders attempt to tell their citizens what they can do in their church house or in their home, they have put themselves on the same level as God. It is the legacy and the responsibility of the church to defy those edicts and to oppose those types of leaders. The first 300 years of the Christian church, it was illegal to worship the name of Jesus. It was an act that was considered treason and punishable by death. Christians, as a result, would meet in upper rooms. They would meet in caves. They would meet down by the river at the midnight hour in order to worship the name of Jesus together. If they were caught by the Roman authorities, uh, they would be demanded that the Jesus followers would pledge their allegiance to Rome by offering just a pinch of incense to Caesar as the Son of God and Savior of the world. Just a pinch of incense. That's all that would take to save their life. But they would not comply. They were carted off to the Colosseum to be eaten alive by wild animals. They were strapped to stakes and doused with oil and burned alive to like the dinner parties of Emperor Nero, but they would not comply. Aren't you glad that our spiritual ancestors did not comply to godless government mandates? And so, for the sake of our children and their children and their children, we are resolved at Christ Church of Winchester to never compromise the church for the sake of the state. We are convinced that God is with us. We have church history and the Bible that gives us precedence for being here today. And so we will not be shamed and we will not submit. Turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. I want to talk to you today about being a righteous rebel. Father, thank you so much for my friends that have gathered here today. And I also want to thank you for everybody that's watching online. Lord, we're in this room because we believe you've commanded us to be here. And we believe that your commands are not against us and they're not arbitrary. They are for us. Your commands bring us life 
And so, Lord, we are here today seeking the life, seeking the joy, seeking the hope, seeking the peace, seeking the salvation that only you can bring. And so, Lord, meet us. As we draw near to you, Lord, won't you draw near to us today in this place and in every place that can hear my voice. Meet the needs of our heart and our soul and our body and our family and our city. Do what only you can do. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place with your presence. Speak through me today, Lord. I'm no better than any person that's in this room. I'm no better than anybody that's watching online. They don't need anything from me, God. They need a word from you, and so won't you come? As you sit there with your eyes closed and your head bowed, let's pray this prayer together today out loud. Father, speak to me. I am ready to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. As you turn to Daniel chapter 3, I want to give you a little setup for this story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived in a world that changed drastically in a very short period of time. Their country was overwhelmed and paralyzed not by a virus, but by the Babylonian Empire. Life as they knew it had been ripped from them, and they were carted off to Babylon. They were forced to be in a place that they didn't want to be. They were, there was a lot of uncertainty about what their future would look like, and they didn't have any toilet paper. Can you relate? <laughs> what is it with pandemics and toilet paper? I don't get it. The king of Babylon set up a statue, and he made a law that everyone in the kingdom had to bow down to this statue. Anyone caught breaking this law was punished by being thrown into a fiery furnace and burnt to death. This god, this statue, it had no, no name. It was a, the policy of the Babylonians, a very cunning policy, that they would not require their conquered people to worship or give up their own god. They, they would not require the, their uh, conquered people to worship the Babylonian god. Instead, they allowed them to worship whatever god they came from. So this statue didn't represent any god in particular. If you read the text very closely, uh, it just says that you worship the statue. Instead, this god represented all the gods. The statue represented a spirit of tolerance and inclusion. The role of the statue was to keep peace among a diverse population. To not bow down to the statue was considered a crime against your fellow citizens and a disruption of the peace. People that didn't comply were labeled inconsiderate troublemakers. Does any of this sound familiar to you? Cancel Thanksgiving. Don't visit your loved ones in the hospital or the nursing home. No weddings, no funerals. Call off school. Take three weeks out of church. Shut your business down. Love your neighbor, they say. Social distance. Wear a mask. Comply, comply, comply. Otherwise, you'll be punished as an inconsiderate grandma killer. Have you noticed that the church is being conditioned right now to believe that the most loving thing we can do is not meet? What's going to happen in the future when they come to us again and say, you know, the most loving thing that you can do as a Christian is not use the name of Jesus. What are you going to do in the future when they say the most loving thing you can do is bulldoze your churches to a ground and instead put a community center? Because the church is offensive to our diverse population. And this is where many of you say, oh, I would never do that. That would never happen. It may not for you, but what about your children? What about your children's children? You see, when we comply, when we don't have church, even though God has commanded us to have church and has promised us to meet us at the church house, when we don't, we are showing our kids, we are modeling for our kids and our grandkids a spirit of compromise. The call to worship sounded. The whole city of Babylon, Babylon stopped what they were doing, and they dropped to their knees. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not comply. 
because they had faith in the one true God. Their faithfulness to his commands forbid them from bowing down to any government mandate that required the worship of any other God. Listen, friends, there comes a point where you have to follow God instead of men. Ask yourself this question. Those of you who are disappointed, and I've gotten some pushback from multiple locations this week, pastors and otherwise, I, wanna, I want you to ask yourself today, those of you who are disappointed that we're having service in the way we're having service, ask yourself this question, at what point will you refuse to comply? Is it when they start to ask you to wear a mask in your own home, social distance from your wife and your kids, to block all the dissenting voices on your social media feeds, banning you from prayer, burning your Bibles, at what point will you say enough is enough? At what point, for many of us in this room, we've reached that point. And that's why we're here. As everyone else bowed down, these three young men, they stood tall. The thing you need to understand about your faith is your faith will make you stand out in a crowd. Jesus said the highway to hell is easy to find. All you got to do is follow the crowd. Just, just, just go with the cultural current. He said, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few will find it. You see, right now, in this moment, those of you who are in this room, you are training yourself to be a righteous rebel. To follow the commands of God, even when it means we have to swim upstream from the cultural current. Right now, as you sit in that chair, you are training yourself for godliness. Just by being here. And people will despise you as you choose to live differently than the culture around you. As these men stood tall, many in the crowd, I'm sure they scowled and booed and hissed. Maybe somebody even tried to pull them down. Someone hated their faithfulness so much that they turned them in. They called the compliance hotline. Do you know why they burned the Christians in the first century? Why they sent them to the Colosseum to be eaten by wild animals? Anytime there was a, f a famine or a plague, in the first century, uh, the city of Rome burned to the ground. And so they had to find somebody to blame. Why is it that the gods have turned against us, they asked. Who isn't worshiping the gods in the right way? And so they looked around, and, and what they saw were the Christians. And they called the Christians atheists because the Christians only worship one God instead of multiple gods. And they said, that's the reason that all this bad stuff is happening to our people. And so if we just, if we just do away with these Christians, then these bad things will stop happening. We're living in a culture right now that is setting us up as the enemy, as the enemy of progress, as the enemy of tolerance, as the enemy of inclusion. These three young men were brought before the king. He was furious. He said, if you don't bow down, I'll burn you alive. Now, let's pause the story for a second. I want you to consider this. If these three young men were to bow down in this story at this point, they would not have been bowing down to the king. They felt no allegiance to the king. They would not have been bowing down to the statue. They had no devotion to this God. They would be bowing down to fear. Fear would be their master in that moment. It would be easy for you, those of you online, those of you in this room, to allow fear to control you during this scary season. There's plenty of doomsday reports. Just get on your Facebook feed. Just turn on the news. You can find it. Plenty of reasons to be anxious. Plenty of reasons to be depressed. That's why so many people are uh, abusing drugs right now. That's why so many people are committing suicide right now. That's why so many people are are quick to go and protest and riot and loot right now. Fear can easily and quickly take you off your feet. But look at how these three men responded in a very scary situation. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We don't have to defend 
ourselves. Friends, let me give you permission. Stop trying to explain yourself to the God-haters of this world. You don't have to defend yourself to people that are godless. You don't have to defend yourself while you're here on Sunday to worship Jesus during a pandemic. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to explain why you don't agree with sexual perversion. You don't have to explain that to a godless world. You don't have to explain why you are a proponent of traditional biblical marriage. You don't have to explain these kind of things. You, my friend, are on God's side. God is with you in this matter. He does not change like a shifting shadow. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he says, heaven and earth will pass away. The cultural trends will change. The ideologies will change. The governments will change. But my word will never change. Christians, we are past the season of concerning ourselves with optics. That's the language that I heard this week. I think this is a bad look for us to have service in the middle of a pandemic. I think it's a bad look. I think it communicates the wrong thing to the outsiders. Friends, we can no longer placate to a godless culture. When the light compromises with the darkness, do you know what you get? You get more darkness. Jesus said, faithfulness to me will result in hatefulness for men. That's what he said. The spirit of disobedience will hate the Holy Spirit that resides in you. So stop concerning yourself with what they think. Instead, focus on what God says. Serve God, not men. Why? It is not your image that will save the lost. It's your faithfulness. Let me say that again. We've missed this distinction so badly in the last 20 years. It is not your image that will save the lost. It is not your image that will change their minds and their hearts. It is your faithfulness to God. Let me tell you why the church exploded in the first 300 years. Even though it was illegal, even though people were getting dragged to the Colosseum and and, and, and eaten by wild animals and they were getting burned alive. Let me tell you why it exploded. They didn't have fancy buildings. They didn't have a nice PA system. They didn't have beautiful singers. They didn't have crafty messages. They were faithful unto death. And the outsider saw them in the Colosseum, and the wild animals are attacking them. And you can see, you can read, you can read the accounts in history. And you see these Christians who bravely stood there as the animals are eating their flesh. And, and, and so many of these accounts, it says that they, they looked like angels who had fallen asleep. And so the, the non-believers, the godless people of that society, they looked at those Christians and they said, there is something different about them. That's what's going to change the world. It's not our image, it's our faithfulness. Verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Someone watching this today, you need to be reminded that God is able. His arm is not too short to save. His ear is not too deaf to hear. There is nothing too hard for our God. God breathed the universe into existence out of nothing, and he holds the immeasurable cosmos in the tip of his finger He rules the creation with his feet up in a recliner. He's got a cold L8 in his right hand. It's easy. It's light work for him. Do you think he's overwhelmed by the coronavirus? Do you think he's overwhelmed by the financial state of our world? Do you think he's overwhelmed by the political divisiveness? Do you think he's overwhelmed by anything in this planet? You may be overwhelmed, but God never is. Even when you can't, even when the hospitals can't, even when the bank can't, even when the companies can't, even when the government can, my God can. God is able and he is willing. And that's why these boys, these men say, he will deliver us. It's one thing to know God can. It's another thing to know that God will. I want to encourage you today to get this through your head. God will be with you and he will deliver you. He will. 
You need to believe that again. How do I know that's the truth? Because you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Jesus put on flesh and bones, and he stepped out of heaven, and he came down here to earth, and he lived a perfect life with his eyes the whole time on the cross, and he walked all the way to the cross and died so that you might live. Now, let me ask you a question. If Jesus was willing to go to all that trouble to save you before, don't you think he'll save you again? If he stepped out of heaven to save you before, don't you think he'll reach out of heaven to answer your prayers now? God is able. He will deliver you. Amen? Verse 18, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Fear will have you saying, what if? What if I get thrown in that furnace? What if a loved one gets coronavirus? What if I lose my job or my house or my car? What if this lasts for another year? Faith will have you saying, even if, even if I get the coronavirus, even if I go broke, even if this lasts forever, even if I get fired, even if I get thrown in jail, even if I get thrown in a fiery furnace, I will not be controlled by fear. I will not bow down to godless tyrants. I will worship Jesus no matter what, even if. I want to even if faith, don't you? And even if faith, we need more Christians that have that kind of a faith. Too many Christians have an only if faith. I'll worship God only if he blesses me, only if he protects me, only if he gives me what I want. What happens to that kind of faith in the fire? What happens to that kind of faith when the persecution comes? What happens to that kind of faith when it begins to cost you something? It gets burnt up. It melts away. It won't last. You see, we're in a furnace right now of sorts, and it is separating the real from the fake. We need an even if faith. God, I want to worship you, not because of what you can do for me, but because of who you are. I want to worship you, not so I can get a provision, but I want to worship you because you are a provider. Not so I can get a healing, but because you are a healer. I want to worship you, not to, 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 to get something from me, but just because you deserve it, just because you're worthy. Do you want an even if faith? People ask me, they say, well, why don't you just do online church? Why don't you just do online church? It's, not, it's just the same. It's all, it's all the same. The Bible says don't neglect meeting together. Don't, don't neglect assembling together. That's what the Bible says, what God commanded us to do. I want you to think about something. If you can't be faithful in the small things, how are you going to be faithful in the big things? Here's part of the problem. People are looking at this virus like this is our greatest threat. Now, I want to remind you of something. Satan is a master deceiver. It's a master deceiver. There's a lot of deception. There's a lot of manipulation that's going on with this virus. And nobody wants to talk about it. And so what if, what if, what if this is actually what's going on? What if Satan is saying, focus on this virus so that over here, he can be doing all sorts of cultural things, all sorts of ideology things, all sorts of things to set up a framework that's actually going to destroy us. Satan's so like, hey, focus on this virus. Here's some manipulation for you. When all this started, when all this started, the governor of Connecticut, he came out and said, we've had our first infant death from coronavirus. That's what he said. Ended the news conference. Two days later, it came out. You know what the cause of that infant death was? The mother had rolled over and slept on her child, and it suffered. It, it, it uh, suffocated. The baby suffocated. And they said it was a coronavirus death because the baby tested positive for coronavirus. It's manipulation. When you've got the governor of California who says, hey, let's lock everything down for eight months, but yet he goes to the most expensive restaurant in all of California and eats a $400 meal surrounded by all of his best friends, no mask, no social distancing, 
while everybody else is eating spam out of their <laughs> cupboard. See, there's manipulation going on. I'm not saying this is a real virus. This is a real thing. We need to pre- take precautions. We need to be safe. We do. I'm not saying it's not real. This is what I'm saying. I think that the enemy has got us so focused on this that we're missing out on all of these other threats. And so that's why we're here to prepare ourselves for these other threats that are actually a lot more serious to our civilization, to our way of life, to our Christianity than this virus. Why are we here? Many people are not coming to church out of fear right now. A friend that I know has been coming to church, but his, his teenage children have not been coming. He asked his oldest son, he said, why haven't you even been coming to church? And his son said, Dad, I'm just really concerned for you. He said, I'm scared I'm going to get this, and I'm going to give it to you, and you're, and you're not in great health, and so I'm scared that it, it's going to hurt you. A couple days later, they went to the gas station, he and his son. And he said, son, why don't you get out and pump my gas? His son wouldn't do it. He was afraid. So the dad had to get out, high-risk father, and pump the gas. He got back in the car, and he said, son, don't talk to me about not coming to church because you're afraid for my safety. I get it if you're scared. It is scary, and there's a lot of uncertainty. I get it. But Gerald said this this morning, at a certain point, you got to trust God. And if you're going to run, listen, if you're going to run from a virus that has a 99.96% survival rate, then what are you going to do with the brown shirts come knocking on your door? What are you going to do when the compliance officers come knocking at your door? What are you going to do when the Roman soldiers start knocking on your door and there's a 0% survival rate? What are you going to do then? Just by being here today, you are building up your courage to overcome fear with faith. These three men, they didn't stare down the fiery furnace just from the get-go. This happened because if you read chapter 1 of Daniel, these men get carted off to Babylon. The, the, the king wants to feed them from the king's table. This food has all been sacrificed to idols. And in this very small thing, they said, no, we will not eat the king's food. It started with something small. You see, if you're faithful in the small, God will build your faith and prepare you for what's big. The future, my friends, will require Christians to be righteous rebels. It will. Your faith, your uncompromised faith is going to begin to cost you something. I saw just this week on YouTube, this scientist in Germany was live streaming a podcast, and the German police officers kicked in his door and arrested him. What was his crime? He dissented on the coronavirus lockdowns. That was his crime. They dragged him off to jail. I saw a video of a church in China get raided this last week. The pastors were put in handcuffs and arrested. All the people in the audience were fined. What was their crime? They were an unsanctioned church. It's time that we get ready. This stuff isn't going to stop. It doesn't know any boundaries. These ideologies are coming for us, and it's going to threaten you. Your faith is going to cost you something, and so it's time that you start getting ready. How do you get ready? By showing up. By saying, even if this costs me something, I will follow Jesus. And God rewards faith. I don't know why we've forgotten about this, but we're saved by grace through faith. Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Faith is the key that unlocks the blessings of heaven. These boys had faith to stand up to a king. I wonder, what do you have faith for? And do you believe that faith makes any difference? You see, I do. I believe that Elijah was a man just like us, and he prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. He had faith. I believe that God answers our prayers in the same way. I believe we're not limited in the way the world is limited. And so maybe it's time for us to just start trusting God again. These boys had faith to stand up a king, and and I want you to see what happened to them. Verse 19 and 20, 
He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times more than was customary, and he commanded some of the best soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. Wait, what? That's not how this story is supposed to end, is it? God is supposed to save us from bad things happening, isn't he? He's supposed to keep us from getting the virus. He's supposed to keep us from losing our job. He's supposed to keep us from having any sort of trouble. When we give our life to Jesus, our, our tires will never go flat and our roof will never leak and we'll always be well. More often than not, God will save you, not from the fire, he'll save you through the fire. The scriptures say that the flames were so hot that the men, the, ar the armed guards who threw them in there were burned up. The king peered into the furnace expecting to see those boys burnt up. But what he saw amazed them. Those boys, those men were walking around the furnace unaffected by the flames. The king looked a little bit closer and he saw a fourth man. He said, didn't we just throw three men into the furnace? And, and he said, I see a fourth man and he looks like a son of the gods. Listen to me. When things heat up in your life, Jesus will show up. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, you will not be swept over. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. In every furnace, God is with you. In every furnace, he is with you. And you'll never be closer to Jesus than when you're enduring a fiery trial. He is right there. You don't have to be afraid. You can have faith. The king opened up the furnace, and the boys came out of the fire. And the Bible says, Daniel chapter 3, verse 27, the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. This is not a time to bow down in fear. This is a time to walk in faith. Let me tell you why. Because the fire will not affect you in the way it affects godless people. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. You've been set apart. You've got a special calling, plan, and purpose on your life. God has anointed you. Whatever God leads you to, as a result, he will lead you through. Jesus will meet you in the fire, and Jesus will see you through the fire. And on the other side, you won't even smell like smoke. What the enemy meant for evil, God will use for good. Upon seeing these boys unaffected by the flames, the king declared, no other God can save in this way. You see, when the church stands out in faith, when we do what's not culturally appropriate or culturally acceptable, we will get persecuted and people will be saved. So, to all the godless powers and principalities of this world, we will not bow down. We will not comply with any attempt to dismantle our family or disrupt the church. Not now, not ever. Instead, we will stand tall for the glory of God and the hope of the people of this city. And in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we take a stand against the work of the enemy and we declare by the name above every name, victory over the darkness. And as the church faithfully walks through the fire, may Winchester, may Clark County, may Kentucky, may the nation say, no other God can save in this way. Amen. Father, thank you for meeting us in the fire. You never leave. You never forsake. You go before us, Lord. You make a way where there is no way. There is none like you. Lord, may our fear decrease and our faith increase. Help us to have an even if faith. When the world panics, Lord, give us peace. As they cower, give us courage. Help us to show the world there is no other God that can save in this way. I pray the furnace, Lord, that we may be entering ignites the flames of revival in our city. Help us be the light in the darkness. Bless us, Lord. Guide us. Strengthen us provide for us, protect us, heal us. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you're carrying a heavy burden, I've got great news for you. Jesus is in this place. And he is a healer. He is a savior. He makes a way where there is no way. He can part the sea. He can bring down bread from heaven. What is it that you need today? Won't you come to him? You see, I believe when we put feet to our faith, when we put feet to our, our, our prayers, when we step out from our seat and we walk down this aisle and we get on our knees before Jesus, that he meets us here in a supernatural way. And so what are you carrying today? Come. If you're watching this online, EJ, we still online? If you're watching this online, I don't want you to feel attacked. I want you to be challenged. We have prayed. We have sought the Lord. We have had discussions. And we are convinced that we are right where we're supposed to be. I'm not asking you to do something you don't feel comfortable with. This is what I'm asking you to do. You seek the Lord. You seek the Lord with all your heart. And you see how he's leading you. And wherever God leads you, you walk in that direction confidently. Because wherever he leads you, he's leading you away from death and he is leading you towards life. I want you to know there is a battle awaiting us. There is a furnace awaiting us. It is awaiting all of us. But let me tell you something. In that furnace, Jesus is waiting. And he will be more real to you then than at any point in your life. Greater is he that is in me than, it, than he is in the world. Amen? Let's all stand together and worship.